Fear blocks blessings. Uh, 2 John 8. Little book of John at the back of the Bible. Verse 8. It says, look to yourselves that we do not lose rewards we work for. That we accomplish. But that we may receive a full reward. Full reward. So looking at this verse, and I studied it in different things, is that that we may, that we may, that we may receive a full reward. That means that we may not receive a full reward. We may only receive a portion, a partial reward, or we may not receive any reward. Now, I found it interesting because he, he encourages each and every one of us to uh, take heed, examine, watch out for ourselves, that we would that we would do what we need to do, that we would not lose what we have accomplished, and that we would receive a full reward. Now, I got a question. Is this scripture that we're just reading here, is this scripture, and those of you that are watching, is this scripture up to God to fulfill? You guys are quiet. No. Is it up to God whether we gain or lose rewards? Because it says, watch yourselves. Who is responsible to fulfill this scripture? We are. We need to pay uh, very close attention that we need to be doing all that we know what to do, that we can receive full rewards. That means that we have to do some things. In, in Matthew chapter 10, verse 22, it says, the one who has endured today, like exactly today, the one that has endured today and until the very end will be saved. Or will, ah, uh, yeah, it will be saved. Then in Acts chapter 20, verse 24, in the Message Bible, I'm going to give you a couple here because I want you to realize that it's up to you and up to me to be doing what God said to do in order to receive the rewards that we're supposed to receive, both on this earth today and in the future. Acts chapter 20, verse 24 says this in the Message Bible, but that matters little. What matters most to me is to finish what God has started. Whoa, what matters most to me is what God has started on my life. What he, what he has started within me, it matters most to me. Who else does it matter? Does it matter to you what he started in me? No. Do I really care what he started in you that I would see it to the end? Well, being a pastor, I would. But if I was just an ordinary guy, I'd go, yeah, whatever. Right? Right? What matters most to me is what God started. The job the master Jesus gave me, letting everyone I meet. Whoa. Here is a challenge. Because you're going to get rewards for this very scripture. The job. We all have a job that we need to do. The job is that we need to turn around and let everybody that we meet know about something. Everybody we meet. Okay, so do it. does everybody I meet need to know that I ride motorcycles? Does everybody I meet need to know what I did this week? I want to tell you about what I did this week. Who cares? Oh, make me feel reject. No. We are to tell everybody that we meet about the incredibly extravagant generosity of God. Whoa. Everybody we meet. 
How come you're happy? Oh, you wouldn't believe. It's because of a God that I know that's so extravagant. Man, he just put peace on the inside of me. I just, I, and, and you just, there's just things that happen that you are expecting. Everybody I meet, even this week, I'm talking, uh, we went up, okay, I'll just tell you one little story. We went up the gondola in Banff. We took Daniel up onto the mountain, and then we walked, and Titus and Daniel and myself walked up to the top of the mountain. Only champions get up there. Let me tell you. As I'm, as I'm paying for this, this young boy, I say young boy, he's, he's out of school. Quite obviously, he's out of school because he's working full time. He, says, he looks at me and he says, I like your tattoos. I says, oh, yeah. I says, my partner and my best friend because it's got Sveta and Jesus. And he looks at me and he says, are you one of those Christian guys? I'm like, what kind of a deal is this Jesus? Like, what else would I be, you know? Like, nobody would tattoo a Jesus on your finger, not... And I says, yeah, I am. A, I am born again, tongue-talking Christian. I am too. <laughs> it's like a secret or something. Like, I'm like... Oh, glory to God. Everywhere I go, I meet. Hallelujah. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 14, the Amplified says that we need to be partners with Christ in your everyday life. And that's what we need to hold fast to from the very beginning, from the very beginning to the very end. We need him as our partner. He needs to be my business partner. He needs to be my everything partner. I, and I talk to him and the Holy Spirit, and I say, okay, partners, tell me what I need to do today. Tell me what I, uh, you know what, I'm not going to turn around and give you all my past and what's happened to me and what people are doing to me. I, you know what, one of the things I found is this. Every one of you, every one of you, if you ever watch and follow Facebook, you can tell people that are emotional. Today, I'm going, oh, my goodness, today, and you start reading about it. I mean, oh, my goodness, they're, they're shacked up with somebody, or they're this or that. Their day is like, Bleh. and unless that, that husband of mine changes, da, 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 you will never see me post anything like that. You will never hear it from me. Pastor, how is your day? And I mean, I could just have gone through a, a meeting or, or something, um, been on a phone call with somebody, and they were just like, just so bad. And I mean, I, I'm going like, wow, it just like kind of hits you. And, 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 the, and somebody goes, how's your day? I mean, Titus is famous for that. Papa, how's your day? And I, and I always will say, it's great. You will never hear it from me. Man, you wouldn't believe what my day is like today. I mean, even my wife, how was your day? It was good. I don't come home if I had a, a, not a great day. I won't come home and say, you won't believe the day that I had, Sveta. You won't. But it's so important to know this. From the beginning to the very end, I need to be speaking what he says about me. I need to be saying what he says about me. I'm more than a conqueror. I'm his son. I'm created in his image. How did he create things? By speaking them into existence. I need to learn to begin to speak things into existence like he did. Christianity is not a sprint. Oh, I see that all the time. Even people that I went to Bible school with in down in Cleveland, Tennessee, they are not in the, many of them are not in the ministry now. Because it was, I'm going to turn this world upside down and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And a year and a half later, i am got a regular job just doing what I think I'm supposed to be doing. It's sad. Because God's called some of them to be in the ministry. But guess what? Some rough times came. And they just packed it in and said, who needs this? I have... I. I mean, I, I understand Moses, and I understand Joshua, and I understand Jesus, and I understand, you know, like, 
okay, God, can I kill him and then just ask for forgiveness and raise him from the dead? I'm just joking, I'm just joking. You can see pattern after pattern of people that begin to have a thought. They put it in their soul. They begin to think about it. And they think about it and start pondering it. Next thing as they're pondering it, it will come out of their mouth. Because as they're pondering it, it went down into their heart and it became a reality to them. And as it became a reality out of the abundance, their heart is mouthing off. 1 Kings chapter 12, there's a young man. He became, he was a prince, made many decisions. It wasn't, and, 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 the, and the, his dad, the king, was, uh, he was ruling all the 12 tribes of Israel like with, a, with an iron hand. And, and when he finally, when he got to a place where he was, um, you know what, I'm going to have everybody stand up. Give one person a high five and say, thank you for being here. Okay, you can sit down. Because I, I realize what time it is, and, I'm not, and, I, and, I, and I just want to give your bum a, 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 just a... Okay. And this young man, he, the, the meetings, I mean, the, meeting, the, the decisions he made as a prince, it wasn't so influential. It was like whatever. But I found it interesting because in, in 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 7 and 8, uh, he, he became the king. His dad died. He became the king. And uh, they're asking him, okay, how are you going to rule all of Israel? And he went to, his, he went to, the, to the people that advised his dad on what to say. And they, then they spoke to him saying, if you will be a servant to these people today and will grant them, uh, serve them and grant them their petition and speak good words to them. Oh, my goodness. So many times we've got to speak good words to people. Then they will be your servants. Next verse. Forever. He forsook the counsel of those elders which they had given him, and he consulted, he consulted, began to think, he talked, he began to think with the young man who grew up with him and served him. These young men said, you know what? Your dad had an iron fist and he ruled Israel with all the 12 tribes with an iron fist. And you just go and tell the people what dad did with his iron fist, I'm going to do with my little pinky. He's thought about it. He pondered it. He didn't take those guys' advice. He turned around and he took the advice of the guys that he grew up with That one decision, because out of the decision, he says, this is how I'm going to rule. That one decision changed history. He lost and he fragmented and destroyed the 12 tribes known as Israel to this day. One decision clearly cost them very dearly cost him the rest of his life. Whomever you hang with will determine your future. Who are you hanging with? Because they will determine your future. Whomever you take advice from, whomever you begin to think, because what happens, you begin to think about those things, you ponder them, you believe them, you speak them out. Next thing, it'll lead to actions which will determine your future. The simple way not to lose what we labored for, remember Second. 2 John 8, simple way not to lose what we labored for is actually developing patterns in our lives. And one of the patterns that we should have in our lives is become an honoring God pattern. Honoring God pattern. If we don't honor God and we don't have that pattern, each and every day we have opportunities to make choices. If we begin to do godly patterns, we'll begin to see the rewards that he has stored in store for you and me. What do I mean by godly patterns? I'm talking about not lying, not even a little white lie. 
Because if you do a little white lie, you've got to have, find, come up with another lie to cover that lie. And that lie covers up another lie. And next thing you got so many lies and you meet somebody and you go, did I tell them that lie or did I tell them this lie? Which lie did I tell them? Oh, okay, what the heck? I'll just start with a new lie. And somebody will say, I, I thought you were not there. I thought, oh, uh, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Honoring. Whew. Honoring those who are above you. Praying, First Timothy 2.2 2 in the message. Pray especially for rulers and governments to rule well so you can live a quiet life. Do you know, yes, pastor, you know I pray for our government each and every day. But that's Stephen Harper. Whoa. You just disqualified yourself. You did not honor him. And because you did not honor him, you will lose rewards. Isn't that amazing? You'll lose rewards by turning around and begin to talk bad about somebody or something. Honoring, honoring those that are on the same level as us. Honoring them. Uh, this week with Pastor Daniel, I honored him by honoring him, and I honored him by honoring the pastors that, that we met with. And it, it wasn't about me. I just sat there and listened to them talk back and forth. And, and I'm honoring him. Or honoring those that are under me. Matthew 10, 42. I know all of you know this scripture. Whomever in the name of a disciple gives one of these little ones even a cup of water will, shall not lose their reward because you're honoring them. So we honor above, equal, and below. Always honoring people, both up and down. 1 Timothy 1, 4, 7, 8. Man, you better, you got to have your, your, I got so many scriptures today. Have nothing to do with for, worldly fables, fables, fit only for old women. Praise God, I know we don't have any old women here, so. On the other hand, disciple yourself for the purpose of godliness. Discipline, sorry. Discipline yourself. For the purpose of godliness. And then in verse 8 towards the end, it says, since it holds promise for, see the purpose of godliness, if you live a godly life, not, not cheating, not uh, telling lies, honoring one another. Because of that, at the ver end of the verse 8, it says this, promise for the present life and also for the life to come that you will actually have rewards. Wow. Godliness is profitable for all things. Proverbs 11.31 says, Behold, the uncompromisingly, in the Amplified, righteous shall be recompensed on earth. So we will get rewards on this earth if we will honor and do. Realize good and good comes from God. He's a giver of good. If he says he wants to make you rich, he means it. And he also says that he will add no sorrow to it. Man. Did you all check your Lotto 649 tickets last night? Remember how millions spelt? Got two L's. Here, I'm, I'm finally getting into my message. Many, many, many... You'll have thousands of thoughts per minute that will bombard your mind. And fear is one of them that will grip you. It'll grip your heart. It'll grip you. It'll stop you. And here, here I just want to talk about it for, just for something. Fear, I mean, many people have fear. Fear of not succeeding. Fear of not having their children serving God. Fear of not having enough income. Fear of losing their, their spouse leaving them. Fear of all kinds of things. If we can lose everything, all we, we can lose everything, all our rewards will be lost if we operate in fear. 
Just as faith is a spiritual connection and a connection to God and a connector to God, fear is a connector to the devil and the God of this world. And it's a connector to all the bad things that people experience on this, on, on this earth. It comes down to this. You will believe in something. And you can believe in failure or you can believe in success. You can believe in health or you can believe in sickness. I, I, just, read, I just read that the flu, uh, what do they call it? The bird disease? Yeah, the bird flu. It's going around again. Take your flu shots. Take your flu shots. I take the gospels every day. And that's my flu shot. My flu shot is the gospels. By his stripes I am healed. But you have to have a revelation of it. It has to get down inside you. So what you believe in, whether you believe in success or whether you believe in failure, what you will do is you'll get it down from your soul down into your heart and you'll get to a place where you'll believe it. And from your believing it, you'll begin to speak it out. And from your speaking out, you begin to to put actions to your words. That will become your future, which leads always to your future. Jesus ran into fear all the time, opposition. He ran into unbelief. Aaron did the unbelief already this morning. Talking about... Uh, Mark chapter 6, verse 5, he could do no, no mighty miracles there except for a few things. Because of what? And verse 6 is he wondered at their unbelief. Why they didn't believe. Why, why they, they didn't. He, they, but let me say this. Acts chapter 10, verse 36 and 38 says this. The word which he sent to the sons of Israel. Here's Jesus preaching peace through Jesus Christ. See, that's our message. There's so many people in fear, so many people in doubt, unbelief. Peace, knowing who he is. Peace, knowing that he wants to supply all your needs. Peace, knowing that he wants you healthy. Peace, that he wants your, kid, you want your, he wants your kids serving God. Peace. And then it says, and, he, and, and, and it says, God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and power. He went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed out by the devil for God was with him. My question is this. Was God with Jesus in Mark chapter 6, verse 5, 6, 7, where there was unbelief? Was God, was God with him? Yes. Is he with him the same as I just finished reading in the book of Acts? Okay. Here comes the point where a lot of people don't like this church. Thanks, Jordy. Acts, I mean, Mark chapter 6. Whose responsibility was it to receive all that Jesus had? Was it up to God and Jesus? Oh. Today, as I'm preaching the word and saying that you could lose rewards, but he wants you to have full rewards, whose responsibility is it to get those rewards and to keep them? Okay, thank you for those six hours. See, it isn't up to him. Too many people pray expecting God to do something and it doesn't happen the way they expect, then they get mad at him, blame him, when the whole time he's already done everything and he said, whoa, listen, you want those rewards? I already provided you for with everything that you need to be successful and prosperous, healthy. I already provided everything for you. And now you're blaming me? Now you're blaming me? God's saying, I, I did everything. I, I turned around and I made you in my image. I, I created you to be a person that would turn around and begin to create your future. But not a bad future, but create. See, Jeremiah 29, 11 says, he has a good plan for us, not a plan of harm, but a, a good plan to succeed and to prosper and be in health. But it's up to us. 
Many people don't realize this. Not only will it, are you to have rewards on this earth, but you're going to get them in the heaven also. People don't realize this. Sin in their lives actually disconnects them from all that God wants for them. What's a sin? I can't hear you. Missing the mark? Okay. I, I gotta give you an example and tell me if this is a sin or not. I know that God wants me to prosper, be rich. And I know that it's for Mike, but I do not believe that it's ever for me. Doubt and unbelief is actually a sin. <sighs> that was just a sin that I just did. See, you're thinking of bank robbing. That's what you were thinking about. Or driving your car down uh, White Ave, or not White Ave, down White Mud, doing a, a 200 kilometer an hour. You thought, well, that's a sin. See, a simple thing like, God wants him to prosper, but I don't think he wants me to prosper. They did not, in Mark chapter 6, did not receive the full reward because of uh, unbelief, doubt, being too familiar. You know, I, I can't believe that, that Jesus is actually performing miracles because my son played soccer with him <laughs> when he was a kid. I didn't see any supernatural stuff when he was playing soccer. In fact, he was one of the worst soccer players. My son was, way, you know, too familiar. It's like, I, thank you, Aaron, for, for talking about camp meeting. Do not become so familiar. Ah, oh, it's just our church. It's just, yeah. Do not lose your full rewards that he wants you. Fear. Fear can grip you. All of you. Imagine this. You're out of Jasper. And you're out on the trail and you're kind of jogging along and you're sweating and pretty soon you're starting getting tired and, and uh, all, you, got, you just got to go up over this, it isn't even a mountain, but it's a good sized hill. And then you go down the other side and that's where my car is and, and you're just like, oh. And, and all of a sudden the bushes start rattling beside you and you, you look and here's a grizzly. Fear grips you. You have more faith in that bear that he can kill you than you have in faith that you can outrun him. Right? They run the, the speed of a horse. Fear of, of an animal, actually a person puts faith in that fear. What about fear of diseases? putting more power in that disease to destroy your body than in faith into the word of God where he says, oh, by his stripes you're healed. Fears of things not working out. Fears of heights. We went up on the Calgary Tower. First time we'd ever been in the Calgary Tower. And, I had, and, and they have a section where where it's like this, and, 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 and it's the glass. And, and, you're, and you're wondering. And so I had Titus lay on, on, the pit, on the glass, and I was taking pictures of him. And Sveta standing right here like this, and just kind of like. And I, I came around behind her, and I took one finger, and I began to push her out onto the glass. Fear gripped her. The glass will hold. But isn't it amazing at how fear will, we have faith in something that's not real. Faith, uh, false evidence appearing real, right? Because oh, you see these little cars and they're just little cars going back and forth down underneath you and you go like, ah, you know, you, your, your mind just can't wrap sometimes around things. Fear will stop you from receiving full rewards. So in other words, 
I, I just went and walked out on it. And Daniel was kind of like, he didn't know if it was safe or not. And I, I'm out there and I'm looking around and Titus, he's kind of weary. And I, I says, come on, Titus. And I grabbed him. And then Daniel's looking over there and he says, oh, okay. He says, I, I, I see that the glass is about this thick, so it's, it's okay. I says, not real. I says, look at this. I says, it's just a little sliver glass and then another little sliver ga- glass and another. I says, you, you could easily break the first layer and go through. And <laughs> I was just playing with them. Fears of not being liked. Fears of enclosed areas. Fears of not being able to drive. Fears of companies not wanting you. Fear of death. There's all kinds of fears. And God told Joshua over and over and over and over in the first chapter. And every time he says, Joshua, do not fear. Guys leading a a million people plus. If you had a million people plus leading, you're leading them. You'd think, wow, to, to, to get to this place, I, I must have learned some things. I must know some things because all of these people are, are following me. So I should, be, I should be able to continue on and go into the promised land. But he was so full of fear. God had to address it four times. Fear not, fear not, fear not. Fear's objective is to create unbelief. Its goal is to get you to believe in something other than what God says about your situation, your, sick, your circumstance, and, and not fear not just being scared. It's actually a torment. 1 John, 1, uh, 1 John 4, 8. Fear has torment. Fear cripples you, destroys your confidence, your ability. Fear takes away your sleep at night. You wake up in, in, in cold sweats. Torment. Yeah, I know, Pastor, God's word works for you, but it doesn't work for me. God's word says that he meets all of our needs according to his riches, but I don't believe it worked for me this time. I know God's word says by his stripes I'm healed, but I don't know if I'm worthy to receive anything from him because, because I actually swore this week. Did you notice all the buts in there? You're quoting the word of God, but when you said but, it literally eliminated everything that God said and had provided for you, and you seen yourself in the natural that you could never accomplish or do what he's called you to do. Fear will stop you. But is a badge of unbelief, and unbelief is completely, totally fear dependent. To get rid of fear and thinking that you're a failure in the torment that goes with you, you need to get the but out of the way. Get that but out of the way. Notice what I said. I didn't say you can cope with fear. I didn't say that you can manage fear. I said you need to get rid of it. This morning you're going to get rid of that fear. I sat beside a, a professional bull rider from uh, Calgary down to uh, Colorado when uh, on plane. He was born again. Uh, professional bull rider. Ted Noose was his name. Three-time world champion. And I said, what makes you different than all the rest of the, uh, the bull riders? He, I said, what makes you a champion? And he named off several things that he said. And he says, one of the things is uh, I definitely do not do is I do not party. He says, I go to bed early, I exercise, but I do not party. He says, you know what the sad thing is, is that he says a lot of people, and here's fear, a lot of times cowboys, uh, professional cowboys or professional bull riders, they can conquer fear and get on that bull and ride it. But they can get the, but what happens is they can get in their truck and they're heading for their next performance uh, an hour or two hours down the road or four hours down the road. And the whole time fear grips them because they have these thoughts that I'm never home. I hope my wife doesn't leave me. See, they're coping. 
They're managing, but they didn't get rid of it. Anyone can cope with fear if they have enough training. Air pilots do it all the time. Your destiny is too great to be distracted by fear. People that don't like you, don't take it personally. But pastor, don't take it personally. See, it's not about you. It's just like Aaron said. The camp meeting is not about me. It's about us getting people in here to get lives changed. It's about you. Uh, Sorry. It's about the favor of God that God put upon your life to be successful, courageous, and at peace. He's with you 24-7. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. 2 Timothy 1.6 says this. God has not given us. Our, it was 2 Timothy 1.7, sorry, says this. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but power, love, sound mind. Sound mind is a disciplined mind. It means if people don't like me, I don't really care. My wife might beat you, but I don't care. No. What does the God? What does the Word of God say? The Word of God says this: You're more than a conqueror. You're an overcomer. You're a son or a daughter of God, who created you in His image, so that you could turn around and create and bring into place the Garden of Eden in your house to start with, then in your yard to to go on and expand it into your work. Got an email. It was some things happening in one person's work. And we prayed and we agreed and believed God. And and got an email. It said, thank you, Pastor Doug, because of the talk that I had, that to see it and to start looking at it differently. And it was, and, 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 and work is turning out to be a pleasure. Whoa, from hating the work to a place where it's a pleasure. Fear, here's what fear says. Fear will get you going away from God instead of towards God. It says that we've been delivered from fear. You listen to the world, they've got heart attacks, eyes that can't see, talk about cancer, sickness of mind, fear both day and night. If you continually listen to what all the people say in the world, let me tell you, that's torment. Torment at its worst. Now, Isaiah 53, this is what I'm going to end with. Isaiah 53. Jesus actually went through torment so that you and I do not have to go through torment. He had fear put on him so we do not have to be fearful. Think about it. If you've been healed of something and the symptom comes back on you, the first thing that hits you and it tries to attach itself to you is fear, believing that God is a schizophrenic and he healed you, but then he took it away. The reason I say that is because I've been through that. I've been there, done that. Thinking that he, that why would he heal me and then turn around and take it away? Fear. It, it, the symptoms. But praise God. Nahum 1.9 at the end says, ah. This affliction cannot come upon me a second time. So listen here, devil. Do you understand? Or you can say, I guess he didn't really heal me in the first place. You've lost it. That reward. You lost that reward. That benefit of being healed. Oh, I guess he didn't heal me this time. You lost it. It belonged to you. And it wasn't up to him to keep it in your body. It is up to you and me to keep it in our bodies. He was tormented. And as we have a relationship with him, that means that we do not have to be tormented with fear ever again anymore. But pastor, what about... No, no, no. There's the word but. Get the but out of the way. 
And what does his word say about it? I'm highly favored. People love me. Did you know people love me? Well, at least a couple of them. We need to believe that we can be set free from fear and begin to activate our faith, receive complete eternal deliverance from fear. Will you experience fear in heaven? No. So we read two scriptures, three scriptures, talked about rewards both now and benefits, now and for eternity. That means, let me say this, if you have not conquered fear on this earth, you'll be in class 101 learning how to overcome it. People always ask me what we're going to do in heaven. And I say, you know what? I think for about a thousand years, many of us are probably going to be in school. Learning things that we did not learn and put into place on this earth. And how can you rule and reign galaxies if you haven't learned how to rule and reign your household? Whoa. We need to be set free from fear and begin to activate our faith and receive complete eternal deliverance from fear only because Jesus took it so that we don't have to live in it and we don't have to have it in us. Amen? Those of you that are watching via the internet, I want to say this. Hallelujah. I bind up that principality, that spirit of fear because 2 Timothy 1.7 says that it is a spirit. And I thank you, Father God, that those that are watching, that they will receive their full rewards. Not a partial reward, but they will begin to exercise and put into place faith. Believe in that your word works. And I thank you, Father God, for that. And Father, I thank you that everyone that hears my voice, there you are blessed in the name of Jesus. You are an overcomer. You're a conqueror. Father God, I thank you. Those that that receive right now, I command sickness, disease to leave your bodies. I command eyes that cannot see to see. I command all diseases leave bodies now in Jesus' name. And do not fear. And I command you to look up Nahum 1.9 because that affliction cannot come upon you a second time. And Father God, I thank you for each and every one that's watching being faithful. We give you praise. We give you glory for it in Jesus' name. Amen. See you next Sunday.